The biggest problem that we had was that the market in 1993 was dominated by Sega and Nintendo. They pretty much had it sewn up between them. So any new entrant into the market had to do something pretty dramatic and pretty special. Sure, we had the system, sure, we had the hardware, but it doesn't mean anything unless you have games. Nintendo already had Miyamoto, and he was a genius. Sega, they already had their arcade games, but Sony, what do they have? They don't have a genius developer or arcade games they're making, so they had to find software somewhere. We knew that in order to be successful, we had to capture the hearts and minds of the developers and the publishers equally. So what they did was they went on a very aggressive campaign to all the developers to... If Sony had not brought hardware to the video game industry, I think the industry would be a lot smaller than it is right now. Enough to really differentiate the system and show that it was a 3D-based system and it really blew everybody away. But at first, a lot of developers were dead set against it, mainly because it was high technology, it was 3D. And a lot of game companies were still making 2D games, and they said that's going to be so expensive to make 3D games, no way we can afford it, and it's going to be very hard. Fight one! Ready? Go! One game that changed it and helped Sony, ironically, was Virtua Fighter. Sega announced Virtua Fighter for the first time, and that completely opened up eyes of other publishers that showed that 3D graphics can be applied to other types of games. All of a sudden, it was an elite. I couldn't keep up with enough of the companies that were coming to us. They were asking us, can we do this? Is it possible to do this? Everybody wanted to work on the system. Sony does everything it can to round up third-party developers to support the PlayStation and is able to sign 250 in Japan alone. The first task for me was managing the third-party department to recruit and help support third parties like Namco. My target was to get as many publishers and many popular title franchises to become available on PlayStation. Sony also spends $48 million to purchase Cygnosis, the European developer behind Lemmings, and changes its name to Sony Interactive Entertainment. In December of 1994, Sony releases the PlayStation, now without an X, in Japan. The success in Japan was almost instantaneous. Another three months to get to the million mark in Japan. And I remember the then chairman of Nintendo saying that if we ever got to a million units, he would resign because he clearly knew nothing about the games business. It took him a few more years to actually get around to it, but I thought it was a great statement. The next step is ensuring a successful launch in the US and Europe. To pull this off, Sony spares no expense. The Japanese giant spends a rumored $4 million for a booth at E3 in 1995. Sony also kicks off a huge marketing blitz to raise awareness for the PlayStation. The marketing strategy was very clearly defined from the beginning that we needed to appeal to an older, more sophisticated audience. We also had a very smart bunch of people in our marketing department who recognized that everybody really wants to be 19. If you're 12, you want to be 19. If you're 25, you really want to be 19 again. And so what they did was they targeted 19 as the communication tone of voice. Another thing that, that I think was really um, key to establishing that credibility for us was the idea that gamers wanted to work a bit harder at deciphering messages, you know, teasing a date like 9995, playing with Enos, which was essentially Sony spelled backwards. Sony was saying games are a lifestyle, and we're going to promote and work it from a lifestyle perspective. We very deliberately stayed away from making S-O-N-Y, the Sony brand, a big part of the communications message. The initial tagline of you are not ready was the first big step that we took in saying, this is not your parents' Sony brand. With this new mindset, Sony sets out to conquer the United States. nationwide marketing blitz unlike any other. Sony launches the PlayStation in the United States on September 9, 1995. The first day, 
September 9th, I felt really like, oh, we did it. But it was not really a huge amount of numbers in the first year. It's like only 800,000 units. The uh, initial launch of the PlayStation was a real happy day for me. It just was overwhelming. For a relatively unknown company, at least in the video game business, to get that kind of enthusiasm from, from day one. The original PlayStation, I think, really touched a nerve. I think uh, part of that was down to the product itself. It's a great hardware device, and they lined up some great software. And I'd like to think we did some nice marketing as well. The controller of the PlayStation, like, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's just perfect. The PlayStation picks up more and more sales thanks to powerful hardware and a collection of exclusive games and other hits. We had Ridge Racer as a driving game. Okay, the final lap! Hang in there! So we had a driving game and then I wanted a fighting game. So when I, I went out and hunted for that. I found Toshinda. If you look at the sexiness and the appeal of what Toshinda was about as a fighting game, it was fabulous. It was a major, major hit. Wow. Wow. In 1996, we came out and launched Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot was a terrific launch title. Defined PlayStation as a platform. And it was about a year or so after the launch of PlayStation. One week detected at Squaresoft said he's going to make Final Fantasy on PlayStation. At that point, I felt that the old ties will change. The PlayStation proves to be a juggernaut that plows through all competition. The Saturn launched before PlayStation in 1995, which was the wrong time to launch. Also, at a very expensive price point. I believe it launched at $399 versus $299. The PlayStation launched and did not have very good games. But it was around Thanksgiving and going into the holiday of 1995 where we started getting reports that uh, the retailers were just not going to have enough PlayStation units to last them through the holiday selling season. It really turned into a uh, feeding frenzy. The success of the PlayStation goes beyond even Sony's expectations. Eventually, the success of the PS2 kind of like brought the PS1 era to a, to a close. The PlayStation has changed the world of gaming as we know it. The Sony had not brought hardware to the video game industry. I think the industry would be a lot smaller than it is right now. Before the original PlayStation came out, the media perception of the video game business was that it's basically a toy for kids. But we saw the PlayStation as not really a platform of entertainment for kids, but really an interactive entertainment platform for everybody. Sony revolutionized the industry with the PlayStation. It's that simple. They started off as an underdog and in 10 years have managed to own over half the market. And that's, that's just incredible. There are now over 35 million PlayStation 1 machines in the US and Canada combined, which puts us at an unbelievable household penetration rate compared to other game systems. And I think for many consumers, PlayStation equaled gaming. Today, Sony remains number one. The PlayStation successor, the PlayStation 2, has shipped more than 90 million units worldwide and is still going strong. Sony is moving into the portable gaming market with the PSP, while the next generation PlayStation 3 is just around the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the father of the PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi. And the man that started it all is still at the helm ready for the next challenge. And now, I have the final and the biggest announcement. Ken Kutaragi is a man who has like years in advance plotted out in his head and has an amazing vision of where he wants video games to go. Ken is really the father of the PlayStation. He always believed PlayStation would be number one. You know what? I have to applaud. He was right. <laughs>